If you have followed your Barton Cove quest well, you will have arrived at this point pretty quickly. This is the top of the stairs. Down there is the overlook that they were talking about that you want to be looking at. You see down there, it looks like maybe a lot of water at one point was plunging downward into the hole there, drilling a very deep hole. And if that's what it looks like to you, then great, because that's exactly what was happening. That's one part of the story of Barton Cove. Here's the beginning of the story of Barton Cove. Later in the breakup of Pangaea, when the lava flows at places like Turner's Falls had cooled down and were no longer flowing, the continent was still breaking apart and there was still a lot of action going on. One of the things that was happening is the ancient mountain range that formed when Pangaea had come together had broken and there was suddenly a valley right next to the mountains. All of those mountains was being turned into sediments and washed into this new valley. The sediments were laid down in lakes, the sediments were laid down in rivers, occasionally the sediments were laid down in flash floods, but they kept being taken from the mountains and put into this new valley, which would one day be called the Connecticut River Valley. That's why when you had looked into the plunge pool over there, you could see layer upon layer upon layer of rock. Now how did the plunge pool get to be there? That's another story entirely. After all these layers had been laid down, continents were breaking, broken apart, and this place was quiet for a while. It got eroded to be very flat. And when I say quiet for a while, it was quiet for some millions of years. It got eroded to be very, very flat in those millions of years. Barton Cove, the plunge pool, didn't exist at this time. What happened is that after it was quiet for so long, it started to lift up again. We had some uplift. That's when we started to get some more erosion. The river that had been quiet was now having to erode down because it wanted to come back to sea level. And even later, after this uplift had happened, the river got more exciting, glaciers came. One theory about how this pothole came to be here is that an enormous glacier with a lot of water was parked right about here. And as the river flowed off the glacier, it plunged right here and started to drill this plunge pool. What we want you to do here is to follow the Barton Cove quest. Find what you should find at the end of it. While you are following the Barton Cove quest, we also want you to be working in your field work journal. We want you to find something to sketch in your field work journal. You'll find layers of rock to sketch. You'll find mud cracks within those layers of rocks. You very well might find fossils to sketch here at Barton Cove. Anything that you sketch, please label and try to identify what part of Barton Cove's development it comes from. Have a lot of fun. And while you're at it, try to think where those dinosaur footprints and fossils might have come from. One last thing to mention about Barton Cove is that there are other theories about how that plunge pool got to be there. One theory is that the Connecticut River changed course a couple of times during that uplift I was talking about, and there at one time was just a massive waterfall from the Connecticut River that was landing right there, forming that plunge pool, and the glaciers didn't have anything to do with it. Actually, right now that's the more accepted theory. followers of your Barton Cove quest, you should have ended up here. This is the quarry called Dinosaur Footprint Quarry. It was a principal place that people used to find dinosaur footprints. That's its name. If you look at the slab of rock here on my left, you should find dinosaur footprints. Maybe you will, maybe you won't. There's a couple other things I want you to notice when you're standing right here. I want you to notice ripple marks that have been preserved in this rock that are the result of the sediment being laid down in a watery environment. Think of the ripples you find at the edge of a lake shore. These are the same type of ripples that have been preserved in a rock. I also want you to notice, probably have noticed, that 
and all these rocks are tilted on their side. Just like all of the rocks in the Connecticut River Valley, these rocks have tilted and slid down that eastern border fault at the end of the Connecticut River Valley, which happened when the river valley started to open up as Pangea was breaking. Right now, we can walk up these stairs. At the top of them, there is another slab of rock, and I'm going to point out some places where I think you should see dinosaur footprints here. This lab I was talking about. The staircase is right there. So look at where I am on the rock as I point out two of the dozen or so dinosaur footprints which you might be able to find here. Some of them are very hard to see. But if someone comes over here and kneels where I'm kneeling and then puts their hand right here, they'll be putting their hand into a dinosaur footprint. You can see its outline comes down around here, comes up, comes around, comes back down, here's the middle toe, and then here's the left toe, so we have a three-toed dinosaur. Come over here, here's another three-toed dinosaur imprint. Like I said, they can be very hard to see. I don't know how well they're going to translate on the video camera, but come find where I'm standing, put yourself where I am, and you should at least be able to find these two examples. Good luck. As Mr. Wheat had said earlier, the volcanoes had stopped erupting, the lava flows had stopped flowing from the fissure flow down at Turner's Falls, but that didn't mean that tectonic activity had completely ceased. Pangaea, during this time period, up to about 190 million years ago, is still being pulled apart. The Atlantic Ocean is still starting to form a very narrow seaway off to the east of here. And because tectonic activity is still happening, we have earthquakes happening in this area. Now, if you remember those thin layers of sandstone, every once in a while those thin layers of sandstone get broken up into little pieces. And if you look here, we have an earthquake fault line going right through here, and another one going through here. And all sorts of flat layers of sandstone are now jumbled up into broken pieces of rock, which we call breccia. Broken pieces of rock of igneous sort, of sedimentary sort like this, this is sedimentary rock of course, uh, can be called breccia. You can have volcanic breccia. This is sedimentary breccia here. Up here we have more evidence of an earthquake. If you climb up here and look closely, or if you stand back from where you are over there, you will see an S-shaped curve in the otherwise flat sandstone, where an earthquake has ruptured the layers, has ripped them in two different directions. And you've got one here with lots of folded and twisted sandstone, and then you have another one over here with the curves going in the opposite direction. If you look down, however, right in front of you, you will see what many people have misinterpreted as a fern fossil. This is actually really nice example of ripple marks in sand that once again tells you that the sandstone was laid down in a shallow water environment.